Dr. Richard C. Miller. We talked about Justin's confession. We talked about how he's compare, comparing Jesus. We believe nothing different, nothing different than what you do with the sons of Zeus. You list off a bunch of people, Caesars, eyewitnesses, the whole night. You've given us some detail on that. And I must, I want to do something while we're critiquing the kind of literalist approach. I also want to critique those who want to act like this is Xerox parallelism and like, uh, this is exactly the same story. I've heard some atheist sides that really do not do justice for this whole argument you're posturing for us to see. Right. And, and, and that is, they go, well, Dion Jesus is just Dionysus again in another story. And then Osiris is just another okay. story. It's like almost yeah. like a Xerox copy parallelism. We've seen like some videos circulate on the internet where Jesus has 12 disciples. Horus has 12 disciples. Horus was born on December 25th. Horus was this and Horus. And yeah. it's like, mm, you're not being accurate with the source. So yeah. Um, why would Justin or anyone compare Jesus to the other figures? Is there something in their stories that highlights a comparison that is worth noting? Like Hercules dies in a certain way and then ends up becoming deified or what would you say are some of the elements of those myths? Yeah. Well, first I want to point out that those are archetypal figures that he's, you know, Bellerophon, Hercules, Asclepius. These were the, these were the most important. This was the installment of an individual into the classical Mediterranean hall of fame. And those were the archetypal figures. Those were the ones that set the standard on how those kind of stories should be produced and how they would have signaled in the ancient world. And so mimetically, or following Hellenism, that is patterning after prior Hellenistic form or Hellenic forms, the, the, all those that come after them are in some ways echoing many of the motifs and registering many of the same signals in order to classify them within this demigod tradition. It was an honorific tradition, not an ontologically real you know, thought in terms of uh, that, that each individual was in fact a demigod in the, in the most scientific, pure, knowledgeable sense. Rather, it was an honor that was bestowed on them, almost like a trophy or a, like I said, the Hall of Fame, kind of like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame or something like this in the yeah. ancient world. These were the ones that were the most celebrated, the most iconic. And to, in order to get installed in that, you needed to be basically patterning your life in, or, or have your story told in, in a way that patterns after these archetypal figures in one way or another. Um, in terms of the Xerox copy, no, Jesus is a Near Eastern installment in this. He's a garden variety sample from that world, an adaptation in the Near East, a Levantine example, something coming up out of Judaism. It's really kind of bizarre if you think about it, but if you back off a little bit and go, okay, we've seen this before, a, a deity with a demigod son with a storied life that has feats and this sort of thing that's born of a mortal woman and, uh, and, and with a divine parent. And then at the end of their career ascends to heaven or has some other manifestation of their translated state, whether it's a vanished body or any number of other signals that I detail in the book. And so... Um, that was the tradition, and so it's important to take a peek at, or take a, actually a, a very uh, careful look at, each one of those archetypal figures to, in order to kind of piece together, what are we talking about here, and, and, and how did those stories echo and get uh, used, became used as templates for further installments into the you know, classical Mediterranean Hall of Fame? And uh, it's interesting, because I put in, in the book here, I've got a whole list of individuals that were supposedly sired by Zeus. That is, Zeus was their parent in legend, right? And yet they had a, a mortal parent, a, a mortal mother. And so this was a very common uh, practice in order to elevate your king or your founding figure. These were the kind of, even, even some philosophers and generals and stuff made it into this list in various ways. And so it was a it was a way to hype them up to give them an elevated status to give them a better better veneration and visibility in the Greek East where this sort of thing was commonplace and in fact uh, required in many situations in order for for uh, in order to signal that this was a great figure. 
In the Roman world, we have um, exaltatio memoriae, and this is the kind of the way of exalting the memory of someone. And so these kind of storied embellishments would be put upon them, you know, the Caesar Augustuses and the, the, la the, the later emperors. In fact, you could only do one or the other, according to Seneca. You're either a fool or you're a king. And, it, and by king, they meant something much higher than what we think. We think uh, even the emperors were often not even regarded as kings in Rome. The founding figures were. And so, um, so in either way, what he's saying, you're either the most amazing exalted one or we're going to deface you. And so you get Claudius, who's lampooned, thrown into Hades, and that's his pumpkinification, you know, um, which is a, a mockery of the, it's actually a play on the word apotheosis. And so he is, instead of installed into the Hall of Fame, he's, his story is told of being down in Hades and going through toils and all of the people that he upset now, uh, making him face all of the, uh, you know, uh, ignoble deeds and, and things that he had done as a tyrant, according to Seneca. And so, um, so he's getting damn Nadio memoriae. His, his memory is being damned. And so a lot of his statues would then be defaced and, you know, he's not given honor. In a non-democratic world, this is the one, one of the last major powers that the public had over these figures. They needed then to live up to high standards because they wanted an exalted Nachleben, that is, to be thought of later after they're gone as great figures and, and to have a legacy after them rather than to be denounced. And so in a non-democratic world, this the disenfranchised then, the public was able then to have the power of either exalting these figures after they've passed on, sometimes even before, or even damning them. Now, they wouldn't do that before because they'd be put in trouble, but um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this was this was how that worked, and Seneca is very clear that those are the only two outcomes uh, for any given emperor. You, you're you're either one or the other, and so um, I think we looking at the archetypal figures. I did want to read this excerpt. So this is from uh, Cicero. He talks about it and he lists the archetypes here, and this is how he sees it. Now each word in here is is important, so please not let, don't let me gloss over any of this as as just me reading. So. Uh, human manner and community custom establish that they, as regards fame and disposition, raise up to heaven, in other words, it's a community act, persons of distinguished benefaction, these are people that are benefiting society, that are esteemed in that way as, as elevating the quality of, of, of ancient life in some way, or provided as examples, icons. Thus, Hercules, Castor and Pollux, that's the Dioscuri that Justin mentions. A lot of these are mentioned by, by Justin. Asclepius, also mentioned by Justin. Liber, also known as Dionysus, I think also mentioned by Justin, if I'm not mistaken. Romulus, we've already been talking about him. The, that's the, those, are the, those are the archetypal figures. Now, you might quibble about one or two others in, in the list or whatever, but he's getting at the heart of the matter. He, he carries on and he says, the same one whom you regard as Quirinus, just kind of like what we do with Jesus. He's given a second title. This is lofty God title, right? Mm -hmm. and Jesus is the Christos and uh, Romulus is Quirinus. So um, with their souls enduring and enjoying eternal life are fittingly regarded as gods since they are the best and thus are immortal. And so that's the Hall of Fame. Cicero by the way, let me tell you a little bit about him. So he was, he had proximity. He was during the time of Julius Caesar and Augustus. He was the top senator, the most influential and powerful politician in that world besides the emperor. He had a front row seat to the, the beginning of the emperor cult and in fact was a participant in how that was formed and, uh, and had a, a, an inside look at what exactly that meant and what they were trying to do with the emperors in, re in regard to this tradition. And he writes about this and tells you. Yeah, yeah. And he, he admits all of this and says, this is exactly what we're doing. And so basically, uh, the Roman emperors that come are patterned after these because they also have to be demigods, you know, Caesar Augustus with Apollo and so forth. And so um, now, not each one has this. Some of them have apotheosis. Some of them have the, I imagine if I were to continue, if we were to continue and interrogate all of classical literature, we don't have it all surviving. But, but if, we, if we were able to get access to that, I'm sure that we would find much, much more evidence for each emperor along the way. Pretty much it was the custom. In fact, this is what I detail in the book. How were 
what was the funeral for a Caesar like? And so basically they'd have a wax effigy of the Caesar. The actual body would be done away with in, in a personal, well, done away with is the wrong word, but a personal funeral for the family. But then they would create a wax eff effigy that would go into the, the auditorium and uh, the, um, the forum and they would bring out, uh, the, the public would show up and there would be this huge ceremony there and they would burn the effigy. Why would they do that? Well, it's in alignment with Heracles, who's, it's Heracles and Romulus that are the two most archetypal in the tradition. And so Heracles, at the end of his trials, um, his, his feats, his proving that he should be Heracles, the demigod, um, at the end of it, he uh, is, is killed on a pyre. He dies a, a sort of a kind of proto-martyr's death on a funeral pyre, a, a burn, you know, kind of a, a burned at the stake kind of situation. And in this, his, he ascends to heaven and there's no, there's no bones that they come in and they have eyewitnesses go and pick through the fire. They can't find any bone remains. And therefore he's regarded as translated. His body did not see decay. He in fact was a demigod. And so that's the tradition. And, uh, and that gets re kind of, ritualized in the consecration of the Roman emperors as each one receives exaltatio memoriae um, at, in their funerary consecration. So I see, even in what you said, <clears throat> his body shall not see decay, like sounds biblical. Um, it sounds Jesus-y and uh, Jesus-y, but it is an interesting thing you're describing here. It makes me think of all of these figures he lists as examples and not in a Xerox copy way, but as like a prototype, like you're saying, and, and an example of, look, we believe he became a God too. Okay. Mm -hmm. He's not necessarily saying, oh, well, Jesus jumped on a fire and like, or, you know, like some, you need to see literally in a story, uh -huh. which I find thrown at us skeptics or critics all the time with a secular approach is that and that's, I think, just kind of pointing out why I think so many over-exaggerate, even on a skeptical side, to try and act like, no, identical parallels without the falsifying data. Because right. the reaction typically is, you can't prove, well, if Jesus didn't dump on, jump on a fire, or if <laughs> right. Jesus didn't have a senate kill him, like, like how far are you willing to go? Right. <laughs> like, do you need a Xerox to be proven wrong here about your views? Right. It wouldn't even be believable in that. I mean, it wouldn't even be legitimate if it were exactly the same, because none of the others were exactly the same. All of the other predecessors or successors rather to this tradition had their own kind of garden variety variation on it. Some of them died this way and that, but the idea was the body was missing. That's the kind of the linchpin of it all. And so, and, and that's the one theme that you see top to bottom, that the body goes missing. They can't find the body. And what that signaled in terms of what they were trying to say was, it, imagine if the body was found. What does that mean? Oh, clearly mortal. Yeah. You can't find the body. It's got to be gone. It's got to, it's, they have to be translated. And so uh, it became basically one of the signals that, that indicated translation. Now, the other tradition is Romulus, which is a very, is a different kind of story, but has the same underlying meta narrative, the same honorific kind of uh, mode and purpose to it. And it has, this, it, it has many of the same um, uh, character points. And in, in fact, you find those conflated in various ways in terms of mimicry later and, and, and mimetic um, kind of work against this in, in, in later uh, permutations of the translation fable. And so, and with Romulus, it's a little different. There you get the eyewitness testimony, Julius Proculus and road encounters and uh, great commissions and mountaintop species and a whole bunch of other stuff. And he's taken away in a cloud and, and this sort of thing. And there's a thunderclap and, and, and prodigies. I mean, it's, a, it's very much I mean, in, in the gospels, it's an earthquake. I think in some other accounts, there are also earthquakes. There's so basically following the Romulian tradition, you end up with uh, a number, another set of motifs then that variously recur that are signaling, hey, this guy is kind of, he's, he's, a, he's the, the new Romulus, so to speak. And so rulers in the ancient world, the, the, broadening this out a little bit beyond just the translation fable, anyone who wanted to rule in the Greek East, you know, from the, from the Alexander onward, basically, had to have these different 
signals in in their life. And they had, and then from then on also they needed to be cast as imitations of each one of these archetypal figures. Once you get to Alexander the Great, he was great in his own right, the greatest. And so from then on, if you wanted to rule in the Greek East, you were measured against the greatness of Alexander. And you had to, in some ways, put your own propaganda forth that you are basically the next Alexander, so to speak. Kind of like Julius, uh, Julius Caesar defeated the Gauls. And literally, they nobody had ever, not even Alexander the Great, defeated them. And he did. And that was a way of going, yeah, even though the feat that really Alexander the Great did was much greater overall yeah. uh, as far as what he accomplished. Yeah. Uh, Julius Caesar was able to say, look, I did something even Alexander the Great didn't do. They were all, and I've got a great book on that. Maybe we could post it in the, in the video or whatever that's, that's, and it's by someone that has nothing to do with Christianity. What they're interested in is um, later Alexander's individuals, and, and this is across the line, and people, the individuals who wanted to rule in that area, in that region of the world, had to, in some ways, imitate Alexander in their coins, in their dress. We have, uh, even pushing over into Rome, we had individuals imitating Romulus. The, the, the Caesars, many of them would live right in Romulus's supposed house. They had a house there that was supposedly, now we know now we know Romulus to be a legendary figure, but they had a house there that they regarded as the actual original house of Romulus. And they would live in his house, dress like him, the whole thing, and and put in, they wanted it on their coins, they wanted everything to look like this is in, in complete alignment with the legacy of Romulus. And so basically they were in lockstep. You go to Mark Antony, he's living with Cleopatra and so forth in Egypt, and he's dressing like Dionysus and Heracles. So he's got the loincloth and he's got the all of the, 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 he would walk around. In fact, he was almost made fun of in some ways because he took it so far. And so he's, yeah, he, and so in that part of the world, you had to imitate these figures in order to be, in order to achieve cap, cultural capital and credibility. And so this was a deliberate, a propaganda kind of um, strategy that recurred over and over again with each particular ruler. In fact, I don't know of an exception. So, so the, yeah. the, to sum up what you're saying, ultimately at the end of the day, is that if you wanted to be somebody, kind of like John Dominic Crossan when he was debating a Muslim and explaining to the Muslim if Muhammad existed in the first century and he was not a son of God or was not proclaiming a son of God, we probably wouldn't even know who this guy was. Nobody would have wrote about him. He'd have been a nobody, little laughable, whatever. And if he was mentioned, he was mentioned in mockery, never in fame. So it's because they, he, you know, seventh century Arabia, Christian domination, debates within was God, did God die on the cross kind uh -huh. of debates of theology that even allows Muhammad to even come up with his ideas that you see within the Quran that are even able to take off. But you're suggesting like, if they weren't doing what the propaganda was in the Greek and Roman world, you can just say goodbye to Jesus ever have taken off. Right. And that's a fact. That is a fact of history. I, I, I think that basically in that world, when someone was great, you had to frame their life in that fashion. It was Think of like a decorative frame in the Elizabethan era or something where you'd have a famous, paint, a, fa a famous figure who's painted. They would take all day and paint them and everything, and they would be in their best dress and everything. Imagine that on the wall. Now you've got this thick, ornate, beautifully, meticulously carved frame that goes around that painting that is itself its own work of art. Think of that this way. And so birth narratives, divine birth narratives, and translation at the end of their career to become a demigod or to be installed in this hall of fame. That was the protocol for elevating the individual. This is a person of extreme significance. Now that's scandalous for a Palestinian peasant to be also installed. Ethnically different, not central, definitely on the margins, in the backwater of Galilee. That's the offensiveness of this. So this was supposed to be reserved for the greatest and, and most iconic uh, figures in classical antiquity. And now you have this group coming forward with their hero and saying, no, 
screw you guys, we've got our own guy. <laughs> and so uh, that's, that's really the offensiveness of it. And that's where you see the edge in the earliest Christian texts. And that's where people are fussing. That's where the discussions are going on. And that's where people are getting killed. It, it really forces me to want to ask you, like, what do you think happened that made this peasant from the backwaters of Galilee even popular? This is a famous thing that I used to hear when I was with Richard Carrier and Robert Price was like, well, if this guy did exist, I mean, you know, he would have been a nobody. And then if he was a nobody, who would have ever made him this somebody, right? So mythicists yeah. have this leg up argument where they're like, there'd be no reason if he was just this nobody. And part of me wonders, I mean, why deify this guy at all? And who was clever enough to have come up with that, you know? Well, so it's the philosophy, it's the way. So the early Christians called, this is the way, right? You find this in Acts and a few other early Christian texts. This is their philosophy that they're bringing forward. This is their, their cultus, their, their system of thought, their strategy, their religious devotion, their piety. All of that's at stake for this. And so basically the frame then, and this is where theologians get it backwards. Not that I like to speak much to theology, but... The frame is what gets gets emphasized in creeds and so forth, that frame that goes around Jesus. But the teachings themselves, eh, you know, that's if people may variously take that seriously. But they take deathly seriously whether Jesus rose from the dead, whether there was a virgin birth, whereas the ancients would not have saw it that way. They would have seen that frame as exalting the philosophy, the founding figure, the icon that's being elevated there. That's what they, that's what they were trying to get to. And so it's the content in the gospels, not the bookends to it that is being exalted by this. And so this is a stylistic literary pattern, a generic pattern that exists in, in many, many, many texts. And I outline hundreds of them here. And so basically, the philosophy being proffered by the early Christians, that's what's being elevated. And this was how they did that. This is how they did that in the ancient world. To exalt a figure, they needed to be embellished with these framing contours. Dennis McDonald debated Mike Lacona not too long ago, about a year ago. And he said in that debate, he goes, it's the 80 chapters of Jesus' sayings and teachings and moral lessons and parables that provoke the five chapters about that frame of what you're describing, apotheosis, birth narrative, death, resurrection, whatever. It's the 80 chapters that people, he says, Christians should be focused on the 80 chapters. They make the five everything and not the 80. And the 80 is where it's at. So it now makes sense hearing you say that, how what you're suggesting makes a lot of sense in, in, in line with what Dennis McDonald was saying. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I think that and, and if anything there, I mean, if there is something to be had from this in terms of just humanistic, the human plight generally, if we were to just kind of divorce it from the religious kind of constructs and sacredness of everything, if we can extract anything from Jesus in terms of, of value today, it would be there. It would be looking at his love your, love your enemies and, and these core kind of um, valuable philosophical ideas and ideals that he's proposing there. And those are, that's the treasure. So, yeah. Thank you. I hope you liked my dad, Richard Miller, in this interview. Remember to like and subscribe. And never forget, we are Miss Vision.